so today's objectives, um, yeah, we'll go through lung volumes, capacities and measurement, normal values, dead space, uh, composition of ideal alveolar and mixed expired gases, the oxygen cascade, alveolar exchange of oxygen, CO2, and um, diffusion capacity and normal BQ matching. Um, I want you to consider this question here. Uh, what units will you have on the y-axis? What instrument do you need? And literally, what does the subject do if they're in the respiratory lab? What volumes can you not measure when you do this method? And then how do you measure these? Lung volumes as opposed to capacities of what you can measure. Um, directly rather than being the sum of volumes. Um, so I guess there's four key you, volumes. Say that again, sorry. Um, so that. I guess lung volumes, you can measure directly capacities uh, derived from a combination of volumes as okay. distinct. Yep. Um, so you can measure four volumes okay. and your tidal volume, which I guess is um, the volume inspired and expired during normal breathing. Uh, your inspired reserve volume, your expired reserve volume, and your residual volume. Uh, so your inspired you reserve measure, volume. Can you measure um, volume. Sorry. Can you measure your residual volume using this method? Uh, no, but it's yeah. one of your lung volumes. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Go for it. Yep. Okay. Great. Um, so I guess yeah, inspired reserve volume is the increase in volume with uh, max inspiratory effort. And your expired reserve volume is your increase in uh, exp expiration volume with uh, maximum expiratory effort. Um, and residual volume is the remaining volume in the lung after maximum expiration. And you, as you say, can't measure that directly. Yeah. So the instrument that you need is a spirometer. Um, a spirometer, get, which volumes does that measure? Uh, so I believe. It's tidal volume, inspired reserve, and expired reserve volume. Maybe yeah. not. Yep. Okay, good. Uh, good. So if you were to, uh, let's go down to residual volume. So uh, with a spirometer, you can measure any of the volumes um, which aren't residual volume. So anything that, any, uh, so essentially what you said, tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, you can definitely measure, and any combinations of those that don't include the residual volume. So anything that includes residual volume, you can't measure. For example, you, know, you can't measure FRC or total lung capacity um, uh, with, with a spirometer. So how do you measure residual volume then? Um, so I think you can do that with helium. Is that right? Yep. Oh, yeah, we'll get into that. So the helium dilution method, or there's one other method you can use to measure that. Is it the, uh, the large box the body plethysmograph yeah yeah body plethysmography so that's right it's a you know someone sits in a box and takes a whole bunch of breaths in and out and uh, we'll get into that very soon um what what are you so the units are obviously liters what, actually when, when you're using a spirometer what units would you have I'm, I'm trying to get to the point where you know you're you're drawing this graph in front of you in front of the examiner um and you, you know, you know, you, I guess you want to write volume. You want to write your units down in the y and x axis. Um, so, what are your units? Uh, so, I guess it would be time yep. along the x axis and uh, volume in liters along the y. Perfect. So, really obvious stuff, but it's kind of the stuff that they, they want you to get straight off the bat first hand. You know, you, you label your y and your x axis. So that's really good. The instrument you talked about. If you were Pat, to ask a subject to you know, ask a patient to perform this um, you know, spirometry for the lung volumes measurement, what would you ask them to do? So I would assume it would be a combination of um, getting an average value for your tidal volumes and an average value for your maximum expiratory and inspiratory reserves. So mm -hmm. with their mouth around the device, mm -hmm. uh, a number of breaths at their normal 
level of breathing and a number of breaths with maximum uh, respiratory effort, I guess, and taking the averages. Yeah, that, that's, that's pretty reasonable. So the, the phrasing I use is what, 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 the, what the subject normally does from what I've seen and experienced is you ask someone to take normal, just, just not normally breathe. So they take normal tidal volume breaths and then at the end of their tidal volume breath, they take a maximum in, in vital capacity breath and then down to full expiration and then continue breathing normally. They may do a number of those type of breaths, but it's pretty much just tidal volumes. As you can see on the graph, tidal volumes, one, in, one, one vital capacity breath and then one exhalation all the way down to residual volume and then back to normal breathing. And so that's, that's as I'm writing this answer out or showing the examiner, that's what I'd say, you know, I'd, I'd label my axes, go, you know, I, I have a subject, you know, uh, mouthpiece, first barometer, um, normal tidal volume breaths, take a maximum breath, maximum expiration and back to normal tidal volumes. And after doing that, I've got all my different lines to, uh, you know, that I draw for this graph. I, I hope this works for you because I really want you guys to explain it to yourselves. Um, you know, acknowledge if you know it or you don't know it. Um, so everyone have a go now. Take two minutes. Tell, tell yourselves, or, you know, speak out loud, what law is this? Which value is FRC from the equation below? What's the final equation? Um, yeah, good, good. So Imogen. Here, yeah, I can, I can have a go at this. Um, so this is describing the helium dilithium me method to calculate FRC. Um, so before equilibration, the patient is connected to a known volume and concentration of helium. And then they take multiple breaths with sufficient time for the helium to equilibrate in the lungs. Um, and then you have a second known concentration which you can measure and your original volume plus your functional residual capacity. Yep. So V2 in the equation is your functional residual capacity. That's good. What law is um, it? I think it's Boyle's law, but I, I learned Boyle's law with the body plethysmography, but it looks kind of similar just with volume and concentration, not partial pressure. Yes, yeah, so it, isn't, it isn't Boyle's law, but... Um, oh, okay. What are the units for concentration? So concentration is um, like moles per litre, I think. Is it, is it getting at like the amount in moles over volume? Uh, yeah, so uh, actually just, just go with that. So what concentration is amount, so let's say moles per volume. And if you were to multiply concentration by volume, what units do you get? Oh, you'd get the amount. Yeah, and what and and so the amount in when when the amount on one side of the equation fits the amount on the other side of the equation, what do you reckon that law is? Oh, is that I mean, oh, forgot. it's on the tip of my tongue. I just can't remember it. Okay. If I was to change it to um, kilograms, would that would that help at all? It could be kilograms per volume or liter times liter equals so kilograms equal kilogram on the other side. Does that change? Does that? Um, I'm thinking it's just essentially like one of the laws of physics. You can't disappear mass. Yeah, it's the law of conservation of mass. Um, yeah. But you, could, you could almost call it the, the law of mass not disappearing. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, right. good. So if you were to solve, if you were to solve that equation, this is what I yeah. get. In your textbook, this is what you get. Why is that? Or what's the implication of that, if any? So in West, this is this is literally the equation you get, which looks substantially different from this one. Why does it matter that they're different? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, or does it matter or? Um... Well, assuming that the maths is done correctly, it shouldn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter at all. When you solve the second equation, this is exactly the same as the first one. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I just asked that question because it's, you know, it's obviously different, but they're exactly the same. And this is a far, uh, you know, it, it seems like it'd be easy to conceptualize when you're doing the actual maths to solve the FRC. So that's why they have it in that form. Uh, good. Now, 
Um, anyone have any questions? Sorry, can I just ask, yeah, with that one, why is V2 not just the whole um, volume of the lung? Because you've added the whole volume of the lung. Yeah, uh, so yeah, it is the whole volume of the lung at whatever it's not, not important. you measure it. So imagine if you're, you know, breathing in and out, and then at the end of your tidal volume, that's where, you know, that's where your volume of the lung will be FRC. That's where you're measuring the concentration. If, but you could, you could that do it. just depends at what point during the breath you. It, it, exactly. It has to be measured at a very particular time and that will give you the volume you want. For example, you could, you could change the, what's at the end of that, at, at the end of this um, little stopcock here, you could put, you know, a house at the end of this and you can measure the volume of the house. Like, you, you know, you can put any volume you want really. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, and definitely, anyone, please ask any questions as we go along. Uh, good. Okay, let's go for this one. Um, body Plath, uh, um, I want you now to again take a minute or so. Laura, I want you to give give you give a really good go at describing the body plath method um, and write, writing a couple of equations down uh, and answering these questions. Uh, I can give it a go. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so uh, I think this is, um, as Imogen said, this is Boyle's law. <laughs> so it's essentially a closed system at given temperature, P1, V1 equals P2, V2, before and after. Yeah. So there are two um, systems here. One is the box and one is the patient. So the patient's inside the box. Um, I think my understanding is that uh, you have the patient inhale against a closed valve. Mm -hmm. That's right. So what happens is there is a very minor change in the volume. Um, so for the box, you have the P1 uh, V1 before that inhalation equals then P2, the after, um, or after inhalation, then you have the P2 times the volume is the just for everyone's, just for everyone's uh, benefit i'm just going to um annotate what you're saying so imagine a wow well, this is going to be difficult so this is the box before you do anything you've got yeah. p1 right? P1. and then after that you have a new pressure which is p2 and the new volume is v1 minus delta v Delta yeah, V is the uh, the tiny amount that went into the patient's lung. Um, it's the tiny amount that the patient's lung expanded and decreased the box's volume. That's right, isn't it? Yeah. Because we're great. So does everyone just get that first equation? You've got a box with a certain volume. If the patient's lungs expand, it's going to slightly decrease, you know, slightly decrease that box's volume. But these measurements are very sensitive. So you have box volume and the patient takes up some of that volume. And so that's where this ch minus change in V comes from. Does, does everyone get that so far? Just give it a bit, give it a couple of seconds. Great, keep going Annie. And then for the patient, you measure the pressure, I think at the mouth where that tube is. So there is a little pressure transducer that can measure the mouth pressure. Um, and yeah. before the inhalation you have Again, I don't know whether, yeah, P1. Oh, you, you, you can't use P something. P. Hey, I, I like number three, one, two, three. That sounds okay. Good. P3. Yeah. And then you have a V volume. So, like, can be any volume, can be residual volume if you ask them to exhale all the way to the residual volume, or can be functional residual capacity in a way, depending on what they're, you know. Just to clarify that. So, let's say this. Just give this volume a number, just as, as you explained uh, it. Maybe V V two. Yeah, that's fine. Or V2, yeah. So V2 uh, equals then it's P4, which is after the inhalation, times, so it'll be V2 plus delta V, which is that tiny amount. Beautiful. Again, and then... So because we can measure P1, P2 of the box, um, we can measure P3, P4 at the mouth of the patient. And then because the delta V is shared, it does not change in the two equations, we can therefore solve for V2, which is the volume you're measuring. Perfect. 
And so I'm just going to reiterate some of that stuff there. So in the first equation, everyone, you can, you can imagine that it's pretty easy to get the box pressure and box volume, as you said, Annie. Uh, after the pressure changes with a slight inspiration, you get P2, which you can measure. You already know the box V1, so you can solve for this value over here. So you've now got change in volume. Um, with the patient, you get the patient just you know being at rest. So let's say that V2 is FRC. So yeah, so V2 is FRC here, and this is the one you're trying to solve for. So one of, one of those questions that you might get asked in the exam after doing all of this is to, you know, out of all of this, which is actually FRC, and there's many people that will get that answer wrong, but it is this value here, B2 is ultimately what you're trying to solve. So P3, you know, because you've got a measurement. V2, you don't know yet. P4, you know, because you have a measurement. V2, you don't know yet, but you do know now the change in volume because you got it from this first equation. And then if you, now you've just got one unknown, which you can solve for. Um, that was well explained, Any good work. Um, the one Question, the hero. Yes, please. Um, Actually, just go on. Um, when you, and there's just one of those phrases, Annie, that people say, like it's a double application of Boyle's law. So I just feel like that's just one extra thing you could add, but you know, you got the concept perfectly right. Uh, sorry, keep going, Kieran. Yeah, just um, with V2 being FRC, if they're breathing against a closed mouthpiece, yes. um, would that more indicate total lung volume? Uh, so it, 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 it's wherever their lungs are at the time of the measurement. So if you can imagine that, you know, someone's just breathing normally, um, if, you know, the, the, as they enter this box, uh, their, their, their very first um, lung capacity is their FRC. So there's, okay. like they're not, it's, it's not like they, it's not like they're entering the box with a full inspiratory breath. That, that's not happening. Yep. So they enter FRC um, and then blow against the piece. Yeah, they inspire against against the mouthpiece. Yep. Okay. I think here and I envision it. I don't. I haven't done this before, but I have done um, spirometry myself. But I think what you do is you're in the box and then you just inhale, exhale, and then after you say do a quiet expiration, they can suddenly close the valve. And then when you inhale, that's sort of like they can time your respiratory cycle and they can, cho they can choose to close that valve. Therefore, then you are just suddenly inhaling after your quiet expiration, if that makes sense. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah that's a good explanation. I've, I've, um, in Footscray Hospital, they've got a respiratory lab, maybe it's Sunshine as well. And, and you can actually just go in there and ask them to, you know, to see what a body plethora looks like and it literally just is this big glass box uh, and you can sit there there's a mouthpiece there and they can measure all manner of things really like at the end of the day these are just equations so you can make the you know these values whatever they are by changing your constraints uh, those are all good questions um anything else before i move on what Here, you can i just ask a question Yes. It's, it's more just about the clinical, I haven't studied respiratory, so this is all pretty new to me, but so what, like, why would we refer someone for this, like in clinical practice today? Yeah, good question. Um, so what, what, what do you think? If you were to just... So like, I was thinking like with the respiratory lung disease, if we're trying to, or, sorry, like pulmonary fibrosis, um, yeah. like or a pre-op assessment, trying to gauge what someone's lung function is like. Yeah, it can be part of a whole series of tests, but essentially, um, one, one of the one of the direct, like, I, I can make up a whole lot of stuff about you know, you know, it's important to learn lung volumes. But the, mm. the one one thing I've seen it practically in the aesthetic world, in the world is when you have when you um, check diffusing capacity, as we'll go on to in a few slides, um, you sometimes will want to. Um, uh, measure it against total lung volume as a standardization tool. So that's why you'll, you'll need total lung volume. But yeah, I can, not that I'm a respiratory specialist, but I can imagine that in a whole manner of respiratory diseases, uh, you, you may want to know your lung volumes and your FRCs or something, but also it could just be you know, often done as a research tool as well. Asthmatic yeah. often have spirometry done as, as uh, we all know. Um, yeah. Doesn't necessarily mean you need to have body done as well. Um, but yeah, that, that's the one application I've seen. If anyone has, has anyone seen body plethora done for 
any other applications in uh, medicine? Definitely um, post it on the chat if you, if you have, that'll be fine as well. Uh, um, Lars, sorry, I have a question. It's sort of related, sorry, not directly related to the clinical application, but I just wonder whether you could explain the difference between the helium dilution technique and the total body plethysmograph. I think I, I read West and there was some mention about using the helium method, it underestimates certain volume yeah. in disease. I don't think I quite understand yeah. why that's the case. And uh, actually, does anyone have a go, want to have a go at that answer? So what, you know, body pleth measures something that helium dilution doesn't. Um, knowing, knowing the system, what do you reckon? Oh, someone's just posted in the chat group. Um, I I knew that the helium dilution method didn't measure any closed airways. So any airways that had collapsed obviously will not receive any helium. But I didn't really understand how that wasn't the case for body pleth. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. So helium dilution depends on the helium molecule being able to, you know, d d d being able to dilute itself by going into the various air spaces. And if I imagine that this airspace here on the diagram is closed, my helium molecules, you know, they won't get there, right? So it's, it's, it's not gonna account for this extra space. Body pleth, body pleth doesn't really care that this is a closed space, like that will still, even if there's a massive sputum plug or, you know, a foreign body taking out a whole half the lung, that, that lung still exists as a volume, that st lung st still exists as matter. So it won't, it won't really matter when you're taking that breath in because you're still just calculating this total, you know, this, this, this um, FRC that was already existing there. But with that, the FRC isn't taking into account that, is, is the FRC taking into account that closed um, airway that is not actually now participating in gas exchange? It is, as in, uh, your FRC is, is just your lung volume at rest. So I can imagine a situation where, you know, someone is, you know, just, just sitting there and their lungs are healthy. You will have a certain amount of volume in that lung. You can imagine someone just sitting here at rest and their lungs are absolutely normal. You've got a certain amount of volume in the lung. Now you can get that person to swallow a coin or swallow a foreign body and just have a complete, um, you, know, you, know, you know, just a, a, include a complete bronchus. That, left side or right side of the lung will still have air in it. You couldn't measure that with helium dilution because it wouldn't you know, get into that space because of the obstruction. But with body pleth, you've still got a volume there. There's still, there's still air in those sacs. Okay guys, FRC, I want you to, um, yeah, take, take um, five minutes now. I want you to just write uh, reasonably in a complete answer with the structures and the definitions. Uh, again, this is how I structure a lot of you know, my, my, um, my straightforward SAQs for physiology. I've got a definition, normal values. How do you measure it, the functions of it and the factors affecting it? Robert, Andrew. So an FRC is basically the volume of gas that remains in the lungs after a normal breath, normal expiration. Yep. Um, it's a capacity because it's a sum of two volumes. Um, it is the residual volume plus the um, the expiratory reserve volume. That's right. That's right. Um, um, so we we know that residual volume is the amount of gas that's left after a maximum expiration. Andrew, just quickly, um, it's, uh, you mentioned at the end of an expiratory breath. Just to be specific, just say at the end of a normal tidal volume. Oh, yep, yep, that would make sense, yep. Good, good going. Um, and the expiratory uh, reserve volume is the extra effort that we, it's a volume from extra expiration, a forced expiration, so to speak. Uh, uh, you don't necessarily have to say forced expiration, but you're fine with your definition. So ERV plus TV uh, is one of your, is one of your, um, uh, yeah, one of your, um, uh, criteria as well as um, volume at the remaining in the lung at the end of the normal tidal volume. Is there any other definitions? 
Um, you can call it. Oh, you mean like in, 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 in as measured by capacity or in other description, descriptive factors? Yeah, another, another description. So I last week we talked about FRC being a balance point between lung recoil inwards and the chest wall um, expanding outward. Perfect. Those are your three definitions. Keep going. Yep. Um, what's the next question? How do we measure it? So we talked about the helium dilution method. Yep. and the body platysmography platys method earlier. Um, do I need to rehash the methods again? No, no, no. Uh, what are the normal values? And oh, sorry, sorry, I missed that. So uh, the normal values is 30 meters per kilogram uh, in both adults and kids. Um, apparently, neonates will basically have an FRC of 30 meters per kilogram within about 30 to 60 minutes of birth. Um, so in a 70 kilogram um, adult, the FRC is about 2.2 liters, 2,200 mils. And in a neonate, it's about 100 mils for a 3.3 kilogram neonate. Okay, what are the functions? So it's got many, many functions. The main thing is FRC is our oxygen store. Uh, it's the oxygen reserve that partake in gas exchange. Uh, in a adult with an FRC about 2.2 liters, we're talking about um, about 290 to 300 mils of oxygen that's contained within that. Uh, and we know that we need about 250 mils of oxygen uh, per minute for body consumption. And FRC can be greatly, greatly enhanced through pre-oxygenation. Yep, sounds good. And, and, and the oxygen uh, stuff, is it? What level of storage is it? Is it the largest store? Is it, you know, how much? Uh, you mentioned the 200, say 200, uh, however many. 90, yeah. Uh, it is the major store. Hmm. Uh, it's the biggest one uh, that we've got, actually, for uh, in terms of a oxygen reserve. Okay. Um, so if we, so in someone who is lying supine, and obviously ever see changes with positioning, uh, I think we touched on that last week. So if someone that's lying down and is being is breathing through 100% oxygen, uh, it will denitrogenate the lungs and we can increase FRC to 1.8 liters of oxygen within from 290 to 300 mils. So um, that's massive. That's why we do pre-oxygenation. Other functions. Um, so it is a buffer for arterial oxygen. You can imagine that the FRC is the part that's involved in the gas exchange. So if there's any changes in arterial PO2, it's, it's actually being buffered by this capacity, this storage that we've got uh, to make things uh, more smoother. So um, yeah, so with any tidal ventilation, the changes are quite minimal thanks to FRC. Um, having an FRC also means that we are on a steep part of the compliance curve, as you remember from last week. So it's a important part of trying to prevent atelectasis. And if you're breeding tidal volume through FRC, that makes compliance so much better. Uh, and because it's on the steep part of the compliance curve, uh, we minimize the work of breeding. Uh, what else does it do? Um, more things. Sorry? Yeah, just a couple more things. Um, it, um, I think it's got something to do with pulmonary vascular resistance. Yeah, it's a, it's a point where there's a minimum pulmonary vascular resistance. FRC is a balance point between the extra alveolar and the intra, uh, the intra alveolar vessels. Yeah, that's right. Um, and also it minimizes VQ mismatch having, having that, um, extra, um, extra store there as well. So yeah, oxygen store, it's a buffer, atelectasis. Minim and it minimizes three things, work of breathing, pulmonary vascular resistance, and VQ mismatch. Um, mm. So the factors affecting, factors affecting FRC, what do you, you get for that? The, ma the main factors which I remember is uh, height, weight, positioning of the patient, um, whether there's any intrinsic uh, pulmonary disease, and uh, anesthetic that can affect FRC. So for example, 
um, factors that decrease FRC, I remember this one um, from practical experience was pregnancy uh, that reduces FRC because abdominal contents obviously pushing up against the lung. So that reduces the FRC. Any muscle relaxing um, reduce, well, basically abolish the, the, the muscle tone of the diaphragm, uh, which helps keep uh, lung volume larger. So that would decrease FRC as well. And then um, obesity, um, sort of related to pregnancy in terms of the abdominal content pushing out towards the lung. And then if you've got any pulmonary disease like fibrosis, uh, that will increase the elastic recoil of the lung and that makes FRC uh, smaller. Uh, what else? And we talked about positioning before. So if you've got someone who is in erect uh, position, FRC is the largest and you switch them over the supine and they will be reduced as well. And then in terms of factors that increase FRC, um, uh, so tall people has got big lungs, so they've got bigger FRC. Uh, certain lung disease can increase FRC, i.e. emphysema. Um, I think there's one more. Oh, oh yeah, positioning. We talk about positioning. Yeah, good. So, I mean, the way I've described that, you've got pretty much the factors, many of the factors that you want to talk about chest wall stuff and that for me includes all the diaphragm stuff so when you talked about pregnancy um and the diaphragm uh, i guess i put it all in one category anything that affects the diaphragm pregnancy abdominal masses posture anesthesia and expiratory tone um and then other chest wall things such as burns that might constrict the chest wall itself or kyphosis and uh, then lung factors you mentioned so emphysema compliance anything with you know compliance factors of the lung uh, and things that could decrease it then, you know, pulmonary edema or ARDS. Um, and then airways resistance factors. You can imagine that with dynamic hyperinflation, uh, you'd get a higher FRC um, in kind of obstructive, in obstructive lung disease. And then PEEP and anesthesia. So PEEP and anesthesia can increase it and, or maintain it. So uh, this is one of the vibes that one of the examiners gave me back in the day. Uh, so I thought I'd just um, give it, I'll give it to everyone. Um, so yeah, just, um, you know, speak into the uh, muted microphone that you have, and just just try having a go at these questions. Um, after I after I ask you these questions, then we'll um yeah then then I'll I'll ask a particular person each of these things. So, just getting started now. So just check, take a look at this blood gas. It's a 25 year old year old who had a motor vehicle accident and is now in the emergency department. The pH is 7.22, PO2 is 256. So yeah, what's occurring? Why is the PO2 high? Why is the CO2 high? And the next question I got asked then was, how about if I told you that the minute ventilation is 15 liters per minute with a rest rate of 30 um, and a tidal volume um, of 500 mils? So why is the CO2 still high? Go, Andrew. Uh, so what, what, what's occurring in this blood gas? Um, so um, from the start, I suppose there's a uh, it's an acidotic gas um, with a lower pH um, and I can see there's a raised CO2 so it's probably a primary respiratory acidosis without much compensation okay. so respiratory acidosis and then just just to be um, really pedantic you know like every time you go to an exam and you get that pH of 7.22 and you have to say acidemic I'm just gonna say yes acidemic because we're talking about blood uh -huh. Keep, keep going. That's, uh, so, yep, you've got... So why is, the PO, why is the PO too high? Well, in the context of it being a motor vehicle accident and in the emergency department, I, I presume she would be being delivered uh, high, higher than normal FiO2. Yep, great. So they're being given oxygen. Why is the CO2 high? And again, we're just asking you to make assumptions here. Yeah, or well, motor vehicle accident. So, you know, she's probably got some form of lung injury. She may have a pneumothorax and collapsed lung. So I think that's probably due to shunt. Yep. Now, does, we'll get to this, but does, does CO2 really rise in shunt? Um, you question, you probably well, your venous... Oh, I suppose... Or if you've got... If you've got... If you've got enough, uh, yeah, sorry, not, not that it rises in, in shunt. Well, I suppose a little bit because you'll get the venous admixture returned back to the sort of arterial circulation, but more that you have lost surface area to gas exchange. And that, and that theoretically seems right, but there has to be another process happening for the body not to compensate. So, you know, as we'll go through in, in kind of the venous admixture section, a slight rise in CO2 because of 
you know, poor gas exchange is very quickly sensed by the respiratory centers to increase respiratory rates. So what else could be happening then for the CO2 to rise? A, a large amount of anatomical dead space. Yes, like absolutely. So that, that, could, um, that could definitely be it. And what, what else could happen? The patient's had an MBA, lots of fractures, unwell. What else could we well, be? Yeah, just, just underventilating as well. Like they're really sore and can't breathe. But I can, uh, I'm, I'm, do I know the obs at this stage? Do I know that they've got a minute vent of like 15 no, meters? Not, not at this stage. So what I'm oh, getting at so they, they may just be not breathing because like they've got fractures and it, um, it hurts and they're just taking really small breaths. Beautiful. What dr and then what drugs would do that as well? Oh, opioids as well. Yeah. Yes, yeah. There's a patient, potentially fractures, anything that will stop them breathing at normal level. Um, they might be on lots of opioids. Good. So now we, we, take, we, we take that situation, which is pretty normal. But then if I was to tell you, actually, this patient has a really high minute ventilation, you know, 15 liters per minute. What's, what's a normal minute, minute ventilation, Andrew? Four to seven, four and a half liters per minute. Yeah, it's pretty reasonable. I just think, you know, 500 times 12, you know, six, six liters. But yeah, that, that's, that seems, you know, a reasonable range. Um, so at 15 liters per minute, why is the CO2 still so high if it's not measurement error? Um, so I, I might, yeah, I thought it would, was because um, if there's some sort of lung, lung pathology resulting in areas of lung that are perfused but not ventilated, um, you, you, aren't, you aren't able to blow off the CO2 despite having lots of air moving. Yeah, uh, perfused but not ventilated or ventilated but not perfused? Sorry, ventilated but not perfused. Absolutely. So this is simply a factor of no matter how hard this patient breathes, there's so much dead space there that the you know, CO2 elimination is not happening. And this is, you know, this is obviously a really specific circumstance. Um, broadly speaking, Andrew, what's the formula for PaCO2? What is it proportional to? It's generally directly proportional to minute ventilation. Yeah, and? Oh, so it's in, indirectly. In, so if you double your minute ventilation, you should half your PaCO2. Exactly. So, sorry for this, minute ventilation. Uh, and at the, what's, what's at the top here? Uh, at the top where? What, what should be here? Uh, I can't see. My screen's cut off. Hold on. Let me make it full screen. <laughs> oh, I only had half the screen there. Um, hold on. I actually can't see. I can just see the... Can I can't see. Can you see? Oh, yeah. Now I can see. Uh, it's proportional. Oh, wow. This, fun. this feels like primary school again. So, um, just to note here, it's minute alveolar ventilation. And at the, so, you know, the more your ventilation goes up, your, minute, your alveolar ventilation goes up, the more you eliminate CO2. So CO2 goes down, that makes sense. What's at the top here? Um, the rate of CO2 production, isn't it? Beautiful, that's right. So, you put, and so what, you know, if you were to just uh, be throwing things out there for this case, what would you, um, what, what, why else could the CO2 be ridiculously high? Which is very unlikely, but. If for whatever reason their um, metabolic rate or, or energy consumption is extremely high, they're just like, producing a lot. Great, like what? Sepsis or pain or going for a run. <laughs> Potentially, yeah. Um, and if they just had an anesthetic? Oh, MH? Yeah, great. So anything that increases production, great. Um, now, here's a little trick here, right? So, you know, you, you get this series of questions and, and you, you know you get down to this you, you just have to think outside the box to get to the fact that it's actually not minute ventilation in a in a normal patient it roughly is minute ventilation but it's minute alveolar ventilation in all cases and if you get enough damage of the lungs you're not actually going to have any alveoli there to ventilate so in this case that's a problem with this um but but really the next the next level of this is um do you guys do, you guys do equipment still in 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 your first part Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Okay. So uh, have you guys studied Mapleson circuits? Oh, yeah. A little bit. <laughs> Not enough to explain in front of 
forward. Yeah. Into this, is, this is where it can gets kind of get, gets pretty tricky. Um, if you if you uh, pra practically speaking, so if you have a Mapleson circuit, it's if you don't have enough fresh gas flow, doesn't matter how much you ventilate the patient. You know, you know, say you've got a you know a, a TP circuit and you're ventilating the patient really really hard. If you don't have enough fresh gas flow, there won't be CO2 el elimination occurring. So this little equation only applies in, in situations where you've got a normal circuit, CO2 elimination, all that. But if you've got a Mapleson circuit, then this will change completely. So then this formula here becomes just uh, CO2 elimination. Like it's not exactly minute ventilation. Um, that's just not something to worry too much about. It's just a little peculiarity if you're doing equipment and they're integrating it into this exam. That's a very specific peculiarity of Mapleson circuits. But yeah, otherwise, you know, good work getting through that. What, can I just ask, what are the units for this? Are we working in mils? Uh, I mean, yeah, minute, minute ventilation is liters per minute or, you know, volume per time. Production uh, is, yeah, probably PaCO2. So I, I should have probably put the amount of CO2. I, I, I haven't got, I haven't got, I've only got conceptual units here. Sorry. Oh, just because I, I have seen sometimes this formula written with a um, constant and, and then oh, other yeah. times without a constant. And, um, and that's actually a particular technique. So if, if, I mean, if I, if I don't, um, if I, if I need to match units and I haven't really got all of that set up, I can just add a constant. That's a cheap way of making a lot of things just equal out because you just have to, the constant in itself has all of the variables that are required to make these things equal. The concepts here, I, I, but I can still use these concepts and it's all correct. Yeah. So the fact that you've got a const, con, yeah, constant there just allows you to, you know, cover for all, all your sins of not doing this properly. Yeah. Right. But I, I wouldn't worry about that. Just, you know, amount of CO2 or PaCO2 is proportional. Actually, proportional is why you don't need units to be equal. Um, if this was, I, I think to get this specific, if you put like a constant K, then you could put equals production over minute ventilation. That's where that would be used if you have an equal sign. Cool. Uh, any questions on that before I move on? I have a question. Um, so just with the um, second last point where you're saying, why is the CO2 high? You said you may have ventilation, but not perfusion. So that's VQ mismatch. Is that correct? Uh, it's all levels of VQ mismatch, but let's say that's going to be um, dead space. Dead space. Okay. Okay. Let's go through this. Discuss dead space. It's measurement and apply the boy equation, the alveolar gas equation. Let's give this a go. So Alex Drucker. Yeah, no worries. Um, so dead space essentially is, my understanding is it's the lung that doesn't participate in gas exchange. Um, the volume of lung, just to have a unit there, but yeah, yeah absolutely. Volume of lung, yep. Um, and the minute ventilation is essentially your respiratory rate times your tidal volume, which we've kind of talked about. Um, so dead space is made up of two main categories as anatomical dead space. So that's the conducting airways of the lung, which don't participate in gastric exchange already. Um, and then the alveolar dead space, which can be impacted by disease or positioning um, or um, yeah, uh, volume for the anatomical dead space roughly. Um, I have forgotten. I don't think I have numbers. Sorry. Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you to guess this. Um, it's like, oh, is it hundred mils or something? 150 mils? 150 oh. is correct. Nice one. 100? Uh, 150. 150. And then you told me correct. You started telling me correctly things about alveolar dead space, but I want a definition now. Uh, essentially, it's lung volume where um, I guess air flows into but doesn't participate in gas exchange, or is it? Not? That's different to anatomical dead space. Um, because it can normally, it can part it actually has the ability to participate in gas exchange or? Great, and, and the way I get, get around that kind of language is go, uh, the part of the lung beyond the conducting airways, oh, yeah, and the okay. airways the space that doesn't participate in gas exchange. And that gets me out of the, that problem. So I've got here the proportion of tidal volume beyond the anatomical dead space that does not participate in gas exchange. Uh, yeah. Physiological dead space, what do you reckon? Um, physiological dead space, um, is that 
both of them oh actually i'm not sure sorry i think i've got myself confused absolutely physiological dead space is the combination of anatomical and alveolar dead space so yeah okay that's the yeah. volume that uh doesn't participate considering gas exchange including anatomical and alveolar dead space yeah uh, habit apparatus dead space so that would be anything that um they could be potentially attached to so like the ventilated dead space and things like that or the, the yeah. um, tubing and things like and, that and the thing with that it's there's a, there's a specific part like for example if you have a normal anesthetic breathing circuit what what part of that um is dead space and what part of it isn't like from the imagine someone's got an ett in mm. is the endotracheal tube uh, anatomical dead space sorry apparatus dead space um, I'm not sure because it's kind of already in your anatomical dead space. So one would presume that it's not apparatus. I don't know if it doubles it or not. As in, because it's, if anything, it, it will, let's say, let's say that the ETT is um, apparatus dead space because it fits yeah. that position. How about the licorice, the, um, you know, the, the, the kind of the angle bend before you go to the filter? Is that dead space? Anatom sorry, apparatus dead space? I'd say yes. I'd say anything that is adding to the work of breathing effectively. Up until which point? Up until the ventilator itself. Oh, and sorry, you, you can't invoke work of breathing into oh, it. Sorry. Yep, no, that's, that's right. Uh, so up until what point? I'm not sure. I'd, I'd say the ventilator, but I'm not 100% sure. That's right. So this is good. Superior apparatus space is anywhere where the two and up to the point which two and fro gas exchange takes place. So. In in our it's really in our in our circuits it's the um it's it's the Y it's the Y intersection. Okay. So from there beyond, I can just imagine that being some kind of vibe question or an MCQ, which would be kind of useful to remember. So you know that that portion beyond uh, beyond the Y connector. So up until that point is apparatus dead space. Sorry, beyond that point to the patient. Oh, beyond. Okay, right. So you imagine that the Y, the filter, the liquid stick, and the ETT or the LMA. That's all your apparatus dead space. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Let's go back to, is there more volume on inspiration or expiration? Expiration? Yes. Uh, more, more yeah. <laughs> you know, the body takes in O2 and gives out CO2 at, at less, at a less of a volume. Sorry, can you say that again? I missed that. Yeah, so as you inspire oxygen, your you know, oxygen is taken up and CO2 is expired, but there's more oxygen taken up in volume than there's CO2 expired. So just one of those peculiarities of gas exchange. So what does that actually mean then? <laughs> Sorry, I haven't been over this, so I'm just going to be... No, 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 that's right. It, it's, it's pretty much just a facet of, a facet of gas exchange. So don't, not, not to worry too much about, about that, but just know that that's a, that's a fact for now. Okay. Um, how do you measure then total ventilation? And then this is, this, is, this is an important question because uh, I may, may have mentioned before, often the examiners ask how things are done and just to be able to go, uh, th th this is how I do it or this is how it's done in the, in the lab is, is important. Mm -hmm. um, you know how to measure total ventilation. Do you mean including dead space, like the Bohr equation or are you talking about? Yeah, I'm actually just saying, how would you, you know, if you had someone breathing, how would you, how would you know how much um, they're breathing per, per minute? How much volume they're breathing per minute, regardless of dead space, just the volume itself? I guess just by what we've been talking before, um, in terms of measuring the volumes that they're breathing in and out, the, the total volume that goes in and total volume that comes out. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you could simply measure tidal volume and multiply it and you know, or, you know, get some kind of spirometer. Now, the other way they do this is they just have a valve box. So every time you inspire the valve closes every time you expire it goes into a bag which then collects the volume so this is this is one of those techniques that you can actually just collect and expire the gas without any other further complicated equipment um, but th that's then important because then you can calculate you know your total alveolar ventilation so how would you calculate that you know you can calculate your total ventilation by a subject pretty much just breathing out into a box and then you can calculate the anat you know the um you know, you can take away all the dead, dead space ventilations from that. Yeah. Good. Okay, how do you calculate anatomical dead space? Yes, this is um, Fowler's equation, Fowler's single breath method, is that it? Yeah, it is. Actually, what I'm gonna get is I'm gonna get everyone to, again, um, take a couple of minutes. So everyone just speak, speak to yourselves to try and explain this diagram. 
Um, and just note that this diagram is different to this one and you know, just note how you get from there to there. And what I wanna, you know, what, what I've been asked in the past is, you know, how, what would you ask the subject to do as you're making these measurements? And then how do you calculate the dead space, um, the anatomical dead space from this? So, um, so this is Fowler's method. Um, so you take a single breath of 100% oxygen and yes. this um, displaces the nitrogen in your lungs. So the volume that you expire and the concentration of nitrogen in that volume are measured. And um, this is plotted on the graph that you see in B. So the nitrogen concentration percentage and the expired volume in liters on the x-axis. That was pretty good. How do you measure the volume, by the way? Um, using that sampling tube in the nitrogen meter. Beyond that, I don't know. Yeah, that's right. They, they use a, um, a flow meter. So you okay. can any kind of flow meter. And as you see, what are the units on that first graph? So nitrogen concentration in, as a percentage and time in seconds. If you have a flow meter that says liters per second and you integrate that with respect to time, then you can get volume on the x-axis, which uh. is identical, but volume is what you want the units to be in when you're making this measurement. Mm. Um, but you're right. So you pretty much have someone with a you know, couple of measurement devices on them, a rapid nitrogen analyzer and a flow meter of sorts. Um, single breath of 100% oxygen. So most of their, you know, all of their anatomical dead space, uh, you, know, you know, has that oxygen. There's no other nitrogen to, except the stuff that's already present in the lungs from the previous breaths that they've done. And then on expiration, you analyze how much nitrogen and obviously there'll be no nitrogen at the start because of that 100% oxygen and it'll slowly increase as you get a mixture of, um, you know, that transitional zone dead space gas. So what, what are your, um, you know, how much, what, what is the value uh, of, your, of your anatomical dead space? Like, how do you make that measurement? I can't actually remember, sorry. <laughs> but I guess um, you would calculate it, just going off the graph that I'm seeing in front of me, um, my guess is that you would calculate it um, based off the maybe based off the um, steep upslope on that graph and creating a gradient or calculating the gradient under that graph, the area under that graph, just a guess. Yes, yeah, so what they do, and not, not a bad guess, um, from the moment the patient starts expiring, so you mm -hmm. start you know, getting a volume reading, and then that will slowly you know, rise as more alveolar gas with nitrogen exists, and then it'll get to a plateau so the way they've made this as a standard, this is not an exact method, this is the thing to get across. Like there's no, you know, they've, they've made these arbitrary, arbitrary decisions here to be able to have a standard. But essentially, if you take this quadrant, this, this little area here, which is area A, and that equals area B, that they're able to then make a standard that the midpoint is roughly what they're going to calculate anatomical dead space at. So what they say, this effect measures the volume of the conducting airways down to the midpoint of the transition from dead space to alveolar gas. So it seems like from that, you know, from, from what they've said, it's a, it's a, you know, it's just an approximation of what your anatomical dead space will be. Um, does that make sense? Uh, any questions about that? But here, I just have a question about a slightly different graph that I've seen, and I wanted to check if it's something that you were aware of or not. Yeah, um, so I've seen like a fourth part of the graph where there's um, an inflection of nitrogen concentration at the end, which is a result of the apical lungs having more nitrogen. Um, and at that point, you're at closing capacity. Is that something that you have seen? Is that, it's just, it's come from a non-recommended text at all. No, that's right. So we'll, we'll actually get into that um, when we're talking about um, uh, the different the, the differential ventilations of the apex and the bases. Um, so yeah, we'll, okay. we'll definitely get there. We'll, it'll be probably a good yep. time it's a good question uh good okay calculating physiological dead space so uh this so physio physiological dead space is all about the Bohr equation so i want you guys to write out the answers to these or speak out the answers to these so the Bohr equation is the equation that we use to calculate the physiological dead space um, it's made on the assumption that 
any expired CO2 is not atmospheric and it all comes from a viol the gas exchange. Um, so the equation is uh, the ratio of um, dead space volume over total volume is equal to uh, the PaCO2, um, which is roughly equivalent to, the, or is ex basically the same as the P little a CO2, so the arterial CO2. Take the mixed expired um, uh, PCO2 uh, divided by, once again, the uh, arterial CO2 concentration or partial pressure. And therefore, it gives you a ratio of what the CO2 um, or the volume of dead to total. Um, yeah, so just to, just to be specific about that, um, you're right in saying uh, it's PA, big A CO2, so that, that P alveolar CO2. So your actual Bohr equation doesn't have P little a CO2, is that right? Uh, I don't actually know what the official Bohr equation has, but I understand when we're trying to calculate it because we can't measure P alveolar CO2. Um, yeah. We, it, non invasively, we uh, have to measure the substitute the P, P arterial CO2. Beautiful. So, wh what is the Enhoff modification? I actually have no clue what that is. Uh, sorry. Oh, that's good. You've already told us. It's where you substitute PA CO2. Okay. This modification exists because of exactly what you said. You, you, can't, you, know, you just can't calculate the alveolar CO2, and this is pretty damn close. And so, we just substitute that into here to make. Um, you know, this Enghoff modification and that substitutes in for something you can measure. So good. Um, so, you, you, you know, you can get this ratio of VD, you know, the dead space over total volume. If you've got, uh, you know, so how, how would you get your PaCO2 reading? Uh, by arterial um, measurement partial pressure, just from a blood gas. Beautiful, arterial blood gas. How do you get your PeCO2? That can be done from inline um, uh, end tidal CO2 measurement. Inline end tidal CO2 measurement. Uh, how do you do that? Uh, your end tidal CO2 that you can get a measure of. But what's the difference between end tidal and mixed expired CO2? Yeah, good question. Uh, I don't actually know how they do this. Um, I would assume it's done in the similar fashion to our end tidal measurement devices, but with the yeah. whole mixed gas. Oh, that's good. That's good to go into. So yeah, definitely not end tidal CO2 is a good thing to know. Uh, mixed expired is pretty much like, like mixed expired of anything is the total amount of CO2 that exists in a sample, right? So if you take end tidal, where's your sample going to be from? From the end of your expiration. Yeah. And if you were to mix it with a whole lot of other, you know, ga gases and CO2, would the value be less or more or the same? It'd be less. Perfect. And so the way they do it is they literally take your volume into a Douglas bag and then, so then the name of the bag, a Douglas bag, then they measure the, uh, the mixed or the measure the partial pressure of CO2 in that bag. So again, real, you know, crazy technology, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, you just take your whole volume into a Douglas bag and measure the CO2. Um, what is the normal ratio? Sorry, Lahu. Uh, so you you breathe, so you exhale into a bag, and then you measure the yeah. CO2 in the bag. Which is kind of the most obvious thing in the world, right? Like, if I want to calculate my CO2 partial pressure of my of my um, volume, really, I just need to me I just need to have my volume in a you know in 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 a closed location and measure it. I can't exactly do that in the lungs. So I have my expiration into a closed container called the Douglas bag and I measure the CO2 pressure in that bag. So you can't substitute the end tidal CO2 for? for... You can definitely not substitute the end tidal okay. CO2. Yeah, correct. Good, what is the normal value, Kieran, for VDVT? A 0.2 in a normal healthy patient. That's good. Uh, so yep, yeah, so right, roughly 0.2. I think I've got a range of 0.2 to 0.35, but yeah, that's fine. Um, when is Fowler's method not similar to the Bohr value? If there is component of uh, lung pathology, um, so area of uh, lung that is ventilated but not perfused, uh, so any VQ mismatch. Exactly. So mainly, you know, if, if there's some you know decent lung pathology where you've got a lot of dead space, uh, what is what is what are some examples of this? Examples of dead space dead space pathology. 
where something is um, ventilated but not perfused. I think the most stark example would be massive PE where there is no blood flow, but you're still ventilating those alveoli. Yeah, absolutely. Now here's an interesting question. If a, so dead space doesn't really result in um, a decrease in your PaO2. Like, you know, you, you'll, still, you'll still have the rest of, you know, blood going through well oxygenated lung. So it doesn't result in, you know, te technically speaking, dead space doesn't cause a reduction in your, PAC, in your PaO2. So why does a PE result in, you know, problems with gas exchange you know, so that it decreases the PaO2? There's a, there's a question that I got asked in one of my vivas, you know, one of my practice vivas. So uh, just thinking it out loud, I guess um, if the PaO2 is not reduced, then HPV won't occur. Um, Let's say it so, again. So hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, I assume, won't occur if the PaO2 is still maintained. Uh, so I don't, that would, I guess, I'm trying to figure out the, the shunters why you become hypoxic. Um, no, no, I don't have the answer, sorry. And it's because a PE is never just a clot blocking you know, perfusion. It's never that simple. So say you take a massive PE, a massive PE will have lots of inf inflammation and lots of other acute things happening to lung tissue. And that in itself can cause shunt and diffusion abnormalities. So that's one pathway. But also if you have a complete block or a you know, massive PE blocking a lot of perfusion, you'll have all of that perfusion that was going through that, you know, that segment of lung now being redistributed to the rest of the other parts of the lung. So another theory is that, well, now you've got lots of blood going, blood flow going through the rest of the good lung, but that's going to alter the VQ segments. So you'll get, you know, just, you know, relative VQ mismatch in the other segments. Um, just to actually, no, that's what I need to say about that. Can I ask a question about the the last question you've got there? When is Fowler's not similar to the bore value? Um, because in my mind, they're calculating different things. So Fowler's is for anatomic dead space, whereas mm -hmm. the bore value is is calculating sort of your physiological dead space. Mm -hmm. um, so when you were talking about that, the values are different, be basically because when your alveolar dead space goes up, the values are different. Are you just basically saying that the Bohr equation takes into account alveolar dead space. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, so the Bohr equation takes into account alveolar dead space. And in most most people, that should be very small. So, okay, um, yep. Yeah, thanks. Good, guys. So, why don't we go for a 15 minute break or so? So, let's say meet back at uh, no, what, nine, nine, uh, what, 950 or so? Actually, let's, let's, let's make it nine. Yeah, like a bit after quarter, yeah, say quarter to 10. Okay, see you guys very soon. Thank you. So, Lara, can I just ask, mate? Yeah, of course. Yeah, um, that mixed expired CO2 that you breathe into that ra seemingly random bag, is that <laughs> like a known concentration of gas? Like how, how is that, um, uh, the PE, CO2, um, yes. yeah, how do they sort of derive that uh, and, and keep it consistent? Do you know what I mean? Oh, look, you've got, so you've got a total, the, the, way, the way I see it, you know, yeah. I feel a bit odd saying this because I haven't seen this done. I, you know, I've, I've Googled what a Douglas bag looks like. And it literally is an amount of volume that you can you know, put into that bag to get your, you know, your averaging, averaging your CO2. And that's pretty much just the way I think about it. So describing the composition of our ideal alveolar and mixed expired gases. So essentially I've just got this definition here saying the uniform, the uniform composition of gas that would exist in all alveoli for a given total respiratory exchange. If all alveoli had identical vent VQ perfusion ratios, so VQ ratios and achieved perfect equilibrium with the blood leaving the pulmonary capillaries. So definition I was never really asked, um, but yeah, anyway, so this, this, this is um, what ideal um, alveolar and specified gases are about. So what I might get you guys to do is answer these questions. So take a couple of minutes. Um, 
yeah, take a couple of minutes and yeah, answer these questions and I'll ask someone after that. Go for it. Um, so the alveolar gas equation um, estimates the, the P big A O2, so the um, alveolar partial pressure of oxygen, and is equal to the um, partial pressure of inspired oxygen multiplied by the barometric pressure minus the saturated vapor pressure, which is the maximum pressure exerted by a vapor at a given temperature. And you subtract that by the P little a CO2, so the arterial partial pressure of CO2 divided by the respiratory quotient, um, which is the uh, difference between the rate of CO2 produced by the rate of oxygen consumed, which is substrate dependent, but we estimate it to be about 0.8 based on a Western diet. Um, F is a correction factor, and I'm scarring my nose to try and remember what that actually means, but I think, um, yeah, I can't remember what it actually... Um, That's right. You're right, it's so correction factor. What does it typically equal around? Uh, I'm not sure. That's right. um, I want to say one. It's, it's around two, but it could be as high as 10 um, if, it's 100, if there's 100 percent oxygen. And just to write this down, so F correction factor, actually I'll put it over here, correction factor. Look, I've never heard of anyone being asked this, but hey, we're here. And it's, it was mentioned in Western, it's easy enough to do. P-A-C-O, uh, I'm so good at this. Uh, I-O-2 times one take away r over r. Yep, so that's your correction factor. And as you can see, as your FiO2 increases, this number will, you know, will increase in size as well. But generally speaking, it's a, it's a very low number and, and not really considered too significant things. Um, give me some values, Kaz, for um, the alveolar gas equation. Uh, Kaz. Partial pressure of inspired oxygen is um, 149 uh, post humidification. Uh, Actually, so I take the back, sorry. So, so the uh, 149 is the value for PIO2 multiplied by the barometric pressure times the saturated vapor pressure. So it'd be point, oh, yeah, you're writing it, 0 0.21 multiplied by 760 minus 47. And then the um, PA, the PACO2 divided by R, um, would that be, that'd be a measured value, wouldn't it? The P little yeah. A CO2, yeah. And then R but, would be 0. 0.8. And, and how do you get PACO2? Like, we've been talking about how we get measurements, so yeah, how do we yeah. get that? So it's an arterial value, so we'd get it from arterial blood gas. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can, uh, yep, or, or... Or it's equivalent to um, alveolar partial pressure as well because there's um it's freely freely diffuses through the alveolar membrane yeah so you, um because there'll be a, a difference between you know your dead space um uh, your pa co2 your pig your p big a co2 and your p little a co2 you can get this from your end tidal your end tidal co2 as well yeah right okay uh, so what's that number so let's say What's the, what's the typical number for CO2, PACO2? Ah, oh, it's like 35. Yeah, let, let's say 40 for ease of, ease of calculations here. Uh, yeah. 40 divided by 0. 0.8 is 50, so that's a number there. And, and just to let you guys know, you know this, this is one of those equations you'll be just doing time and time again, so you'll just naturally get good at kind of altering these numbers and stuff. Um, yeah, and, and typically the scenarios you want to alter them for is to, is, um, you, know, you know, what are these numbers at, an FI of room air, 0.2, you know, 0.21%, 21% uh, room air, sorry, and um, at 100%, at and just seeing how those values differ um, as, things, as things change. Um, that's good. So, Kaz, what does um, saturated vapor pressure depend on? Uh, so it depends on temperature. Perfect. Uh, and altitude. Actually, no, sorry, it doesn't depend on altitude. I think it depends predominantly on temperature, sorry. Barometric pressure depends on altitude. Perfect, so it doesn't depend on altitude at all, and it just depends on temperature. I mean, what's the significance of this then? Um, 
on the on which aspect specifically? Yeah, and the fact that saturated vapor pressure, um, if, uh, you know, pretty much just depends on temperature. Mm. What, what is the implication of this at, at altitude? Um, like how would this equation here change or get impacted by the situation, just conceptually? Or yeah, so I guess if the um, barometric pressure is affected by altitude and decreases and then saturated pressure doesn't um, decrease proportionately, then it would affect the inspired um, partial pressure of oxygen at a high altitude. Exactly right. Like this is, this isn't taking much out of 760 at, um, at sea level. But imagine this halves at, you know, whatever number of meters above sea level. So, you know, let's say you have, you know, 350 take away. Say your barometric pressure drops to 350 or something really small. Yes. When you take away 47 from that sum, suddenly it's actually, you know, taking a bit, you know, putting a big dent in the amount of partial pressure of alveolar oxygen that you could ultimately get as a maximum. So yeah, it, it's a big deal. Um, and then yeah, at different temperatures, so at 37 degrees, it's 47 and at 35 degrees, it's 42 millimeters mercury. I mean, in that, in that example, uh, good. Does anyone have any questions about that before we move on? Um, good, so the next, Next thing we'll do is talking about the oxygen cascade. And so, uh, Kaz, while you're there, what's the definition of the oxygen cascade? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure the exact definition, but it's the idea that as oxygen moves by mass, mass transport down a partial pressure gradient from inspired air all the way down to reaching the alveolar and then into the tissues, the steps down which the PO2 decreases from the alveolar to the tissues, I guess is what you call the oxygen cascade. Very good. The only thing I'd then say is you'd, you'd have to add the extra word mass transport of it. Um, I'd, I'd simply stick to something that says, you know, stepwise decrease of your PO2 from atmosphere to mitochondria. So, you know, just a really quick definition, but you know, you, you got the essence of that. So that's great. I want you guys to go ahead and draw a graph. Oops, there it is. <laughs> um, I really should have uh, altered these slides a little bit. Um, I want you guys to answer these questions. So I want you to explain. Uh, I want you to explain the, each of the steps uh, in of the oxygen cascade. Um, yeah. So take a couple of minutes to do that. I want you, yeah. So pretty much draw the graph. Explain why there is a drop from each step to each step, um, and then I'll come back and ask someone in a couple of minutes. The graph you've got there. So it starts at. Um... 150 and the reason it starts at 150 is because um the partial pressure um of oxygen is 760 and then there's zero oh sorry the partial pressure of air is 760 and then um the fo2 is 0 0.21 and then we also take into account we minus the 47 for the water so when you say 760 minus 47 times 0 0.21 you get the 150 um, and then the next uh, step is the alveolar gas, um, which is usually about 105. And then that drops to the PaO2 in um, arterial blood to 100. And the reason there's that drop um, is because I think there's a little bit of venous admixture from the bronchial and the thespian veins. Um, I think, is that, I'm not sure if that's correct, is that right? So um, let, let, let's go from the start. So let's say, um, so does, just, just to make sure everyone's aware. So in, in the air, the form, if you take the um, you know, formula, it's just 760 is the barometric pressure times 0.21. So you have 159 um, is the partial pressure of oxygen in the air itself. Then as soon as it goes into the airways, it gets humidified. So what's the formula when it's uh, in the airways, but not in the alveolus? Um, so 760 minus 47 times 0.21. Because that's 0.21 times uh, 713, and that's 149. No, that's good. That's good. So, you know, just to really, um, I'm, in this example, because there's so many people here, I'll just, you know, really step through each of the, each of the, each of the facets of that, of that mm -hmm. uh, cascade. 
And then once we're getting the alveolus, now we can take away you know, the, the, the PaCO2 over the uh, respiratory quotient. So it's one, you know, rough, roughly 150 or 149.73, take away 50. And that's where you get your 100 in the alveolus. Um, and then there's a slight drop from the P alveolus to the P. So the PO2, the P alveolar O2 versus to the P capillary O2, uh, which is, you know, due to any diffusional problems that may occur. And that's, you know, that's really not there in most, in most patients. Uh, keep going. So, so does, it, does everyone get that, that, you know, this, this drop here is diffusion. Um, it's the alveolus to the pulmonary capillary. And then the thing that you were just going to get about to tell us about was P alveolus to P arterial. So let's say, you know, why is there a difference from here up to this area here, which is past the pulmonary capillary? And what were you mentioning there, Lisa? Um, so I thought it was because there was, oh, sorry. Yeah, I missed that step, the alveolar capillary. Sorry about that. Um, I thought it was because the, the some venous admis, admixture from the thespian veins and the bronchial uh, veins. Okay, I, I, I always get this mixed up, but I'm pretty sure it's the Bezian veins. Um, but we'll we'll come to that in the admixture anyway. I'm, not, I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly. I, I I get either one of those wrong constantly. So anyway, I'm pretty sure it's written wrong in someone's someone's notes that everyone has. So oh okay. Yep. Cool. Uh, so that's due to shunt or you know venous admixture more specifically. Uh, so what is the end capillary PO two? Um, the at the other end. After tissue. Uh, down, yeah, down to yeah, down to the tissue level. Yeah. Um, so down at the tissues, it's usually about five, and then the venous mixed venous is about forty. Okay, good. So I've just got the end capillary is forty, but oh, okay. Sorry, I was thinking tissues. Okay, so end capillary is forty. Okay. Um. So, what what is the level of the mitochondria? Um. After it's been extracted, I thought it was about five. Hmm. So, you know, four to mitochondria, you know, four to twenty-two, absolutely. Um, and then, then at this point, you might get asked a question like, you know, what is Pasteur's point? So, what do you reckon? Uh, what is Pasteur's? Um, that is a good question. I'm just trying to think what it is off the top of my head, and oh, I cannot for life me remember. Sorry. Uh, that's right. Um, and then there's a really good story about beer making here. Um, does anyone know this story? No, I've not heard it. So essentially, if you want to, very, very, you know, not not that I have any knowledge about making beer or you know, bring alcohol at all. Um, if you have an oxygen level that is above past this point, then the the yeast is able to reproduce and they're able to increase the amount of yeast in this, in, in your in your mix. But if you want to make alcohol, you decrease the oxygen below a certain point, which is past this point, And that allows you know, anaerobic metabolism to occur. And that's where alcohol is formed. So there's this kind of balance where if you're trying to make more yeast, you, you know, you get the oxidative, you, you get, you, know, you, you get aerobic metal, metabolism occurring above, uh, above which that occurs. And then below which uh, this, it becomes um, anaerobic and that's how alcohol is formed. Um, yeah. So what is it? The pasture effect is inhibiting the effect of oxygen on the fermentation process. And then how, do, how does that, how does that relate to, you know, the, um, uh, you know, the human body, if you're below past this point, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the amount of oxygen below which oxidative phosphorylation can occur. And so that's when you're going to get your anaerobic metabolism and lactic buildup and, you know, all of those problems. Um, that point, can you give me a number, a figure for that? It's quite little from memory. It's like one to three or something. Yeah, I don't have the exact number here, but I think it was around yeah one one two, but it, yeah, millimeters mercury of oxygen. Lord. Hey, Lahiru, just quickly, um, can I just clarify on your um, slide? You've got what is the end capillary PO two forty? Isn't it ninety eight? Do you mean the? Oh, sorry, end capillary yeah. tissue level. Oh yeah, yeah yeah. Cool. Thanks. No, no, no worries. And and the other thing that I think about with this graph, um, Lisa, just because you're there, what are the causes of hypoxemia? Yeah, so um, I guess going from the beginning, it you can have inadequate 
inspired FIO2 and that might be for numerous reasons um, yep. because you're at altitude or what have you. Um, and then, uh, so you might have a diffusion um, problem. Yep. Um, then you could have potentially a circulation problem. Uh, um, big so humus map. It's a circulation. It's a circulation problem you mentioned. Oh, sorry, VQ mismatch is probably the way to put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't say circulation. I'd say I could, I'd say VQ mismatch, absolutely. Um, and then uh, the fourth one. There's probably a better way of putting this, um, but just a, I mean, a problem with tissue extraction. Um, extraction. That will be something else. So that's good. Um, so using using this oxygen cascade and the um, oh, I'm so bad at writing this. Uh, <laughs> wow, this is not helping at all. These are the cause of hypoxemia. You've got FI um, near FI. I'd also put um, your you know your minute ventilation. If your if your ventilation slows down, your CO two increases, and according to your alveolar gas equation, your PaO two will go down. So you know, repeat. Uh, so therefore, hypoxemia, diffusion abnormality, VQ mismatch, and shunt. So, Liz, what do you reckon I put shunt and VQ mismatch as separate from this? Um, because you can get um, physiological and anatomical shunts. Um, yep, but there's still shunt, so um, um, there's a problem. And why not? I guess you can still have perfusion, um, but just no ventilation. So you've got dead space comes into play there as well. That, that actually isn't a cause of hypoxemia. VQ uh, dead space isn't. Um, and so the reason we have VQ mismatch there as a cause of hypoxemia, shunt is the, you know, the, is the ultimate VQ mismatch in one direction. So it's, it's obviously going to have a pretty bad effect. But imagine, we'll, and we'll get into this in a, a bit later, is that You've got all of these little lung units and lung segments with an alveolus and a and a you know, and a pulmonary papillary, and if they're not perfectly ventilated or perfused, you'll just get these suboptimal levels of oxygenation. And all those little suboptimal levels—that's what VQ mismatch is, and that will lead to this you know theoretical amount of not you know not well oxygenated blood adding to the circulation. Can I just ask with that then? So. Because it's uh, when it goes in the direction of shunt rather than dead space, that's what causes hypoxemia. So do you have to say which way the VQ mismatch is occurring when you're talking about it as an answer for this? That's a good question. So no, you don't. Um, you just have to know that shunt is you know, an absolute form of VQ mismatch that will definitely cause a drop in your PaO2. And the example of that would be you know, a, a, you know, a, new, a segment of pneumonia or any kind of blocked alveolus. And you know, any kind of blocked alveolus will definitely cause you know, you know, deoxygenated blood to go into your circulation. VQ mismatch just means that all of the other segments of, you know, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not dead space, it's not shunt, it's just not non-ideal ventilation fusion segments that exist in everybody. These non-ideal segments will add little, little tiny bits of not perfectly oxygenated blood. But we'll, you know, and we'll definitely go through that. So, the, what, what I like about this graph is then, you know, being able to describe this stepwise decrement of your PO2 is important, but to know that in practical circumstances that, you know, this essentially outlines every cause of hypoxemia down, down to your, you know, you know your, uh, down to your arteries. So then the next question is, and I think Lisa, you were kind of mentioning a couple of these there, what are the causes of hypoxia? Um, hey Maggie, while you're there, can I ask you this question? What's the difference between hypoxia and hypoxemia? Um, so hypoxemia refers to reduced PaO2. Right, yeah. And hypoxia, um, I always struggle to give a good definition of this. Um, oh, good, that's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know how I would actually describe this. Oh, that's right. Can you give me some causes of it? Maybe we'll, and we'll probably try to work together to get there. Um, so increased dead space. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'll, 
essentially this is the oxygen cascade up to up to shunt tells you the story all the way up to you know your let's say you know your your arterial system mm -hmm. but now oxygen molecule has to get down into the tissues and what are the impediments for getting that oxygen molecule to the to the tissues um i guess it's ability to diffuse but yeah so let's let's go with this so because of hypoxia actually does does anyone want to have a go at this yeah sorry i'm not sure Ooh, no one and give it a crack but yeah go ahead so i think of hypoxia yeah, as um, including all the causes of hypoxemia, but also the addition of um, things that cause tissue hypoxia. So we add on the um, oxygen carriage, so the oxygen flux equation, um, and then also increased oxygen consumption, which would increase tissue demand and cause tissue hypoxia. Okay, give me some pauses, just to make sure we got the... Yeah, like so for oxygen carriage, you could talk, so if you think about the... Um, the flux equation we could talk about decreased hemoglobin reduces the overall carriage capacity um, of blood and therefore reduces supply which increases tissue hypoxia yep. anemic hypoxia yep yep um and then you could have i guess um like hypovolemic hypoxia with um bleeding that's, and stuff as well that, that'll be termed stagnant hypoxia so that's yeah. where your blood flow blood is just flowing and it could be due to anything. It's not just hypovolemia, but you know any kind of circulatory failure. So anemic is not having enough red blood cells. Stagnant is the red blood cells aren't getting there. And hypoxemic, hypoxemic hypoxia is there's not enough oxygen there. And there's one more. Um, does, does it have anything to do with increased oxygen consumption by the um, tissues so being in a hypermetabolic state? Not, not really, because that's, Look up the, the, the answer I've got here is cytotoxic hypox, hypoxia, meaning any kind of um, cyanide poisoning, um, carbon monoxide, any any inability of the um of, of the mitochondria to actually utilize it can cause that. So yeah. I don't think that will increase me metabolism as a cause of hypoxia there. That that will lead to other things that will be one of these other things. But just just, just to just to show that this is the whole picture, right? So when you talk about these concepts, hypoxemia is all of these things, FI, ventilation, diffusion, VQ, and shunt. And then hypoxia is essentially what, what matters at the end of the day because your tissue isn't receiving the oxygen. Um, and it means that you will have hypoxemic hypoxia, anemic hypoxia, stagnant hypoxia, and cytotoxic hypoxia. And they're obviously very, very different terms. And they often get talked about similarly, but that won't fly in the exam because if you say hypoxia, it will mean this and hypoxemia will mean that. So hopefully you'll go through this in your um, cardiac tubes anyway, but I just thought it'd be worthwhile mentioning this is the whole picture of oxygen delivery um, from, from a point of view of these terms. One really yeah. analogy. Pat, Pat, Pat just put up a comment saying he has a, a mnemonic called hash. So hypoxemic, anemic, stagnant, and histotoxic. Um, yeah, yeah, same thing. That's good. Um, uh, one of the, um, RB used to teach the first part, he had a really good analogy for this, um, which was, think of a train carriage. So if, if a train's engine fails, that means that it's um, stagnant, so circuitry collapse. If the train doesn't have enough carriages, that means you don't have enough hemoglobin. So no matter how much oxygen is available, you're not going to get it delivered um, because it's, they're anemic. There's not enough carriages of the, for the train. And then if there's not enough people on the train, it doesn't matter how many carriages you have, if the people you think of as the oxygen molecule, um, doesn't matter how good the cardiac output is, doesn't, have, doesn't matter how many carriages are on the train, none of oxygen is getting to the, getting to the destination. And finally, the destination does, is, is, you know, poison doesn't exist. You can, you can see where the analogy goes with histotoxic or cytotoxic hypoxia. What is the respiratory quotient? So through this, the respiratory quotient, ratio of CO2 production to O2 consumption, it's at a cellular level, um, whereas the respiratory exchange ratio is a ratio between the amount of CO2 produced and the O2 consumed in one breath. It's across the alveolus. This, is, this respiratory exchange ratio is you know, fundamentally easier to measure, and it's often the thing that people quote. But when, you know, when, when, when we talk about this, it can be used to estimate the respiratory quotient at 
after enough measurements of this, it will roughly equal the respiratory quotient. I don't think it's too important to know the details of that, but you know, one of the questions that we often get asked, uh, what is the respiratory quotient for you know, a carbohydrate diet versus proteins versus fat, and then a balanced diet, as Kaz mentioned, so you know, the balanced diet, normal Western diet is about 0.8 for the respiratory quotient, one for carbohydrates, 0.8 for proteins, and 0.7 for fats. So the next thing we'll go through is fixed load diffusion. Maggie, um, are you happy to answer some of these questions? Um, what is fixed load diffusion? Uh, yeah, so fixed load diffusion describes uh, the rate of diffusion across a membrane, and it states that that rate is proportional to um, the difference in partial pressure gradient, so P1 minus P2, times the area for diffusion, times uh, the solubility of the substance divided by the thickness of the membrane times the molecular weight of the substance. Yeah, sounds good. And how does that relate back to the, uh, if you were to relate this back to the lung, um, what could you say? Um, so you could say that the gases um, transfer from the lung to the blood by diffusion um, and that the lung has a very large surface area with a very thin membrane. Um, and that sounds good. Um, and it just diffuses faster, let's say CO2 or oxygen. So CO2 is uh, faster. Yeah, and that's well, mainly, I think, because the, um, I think it's the, the similar molecular weight, but the solubility is different, I think. Absolutely. And uh, so that's exactly right. So it's 20 times faster. And why? Because the solubility is more, whilst the molecular weight isn't very different. So that's exactly right. Um, has anyone gone into the respiratory lab to measure diffusing capacity at all? No. Uh, um, look, I thought I'd just go through this. So uh, this is, I think this is a really important practical application. I can imagine, you know, I, I don't remember being, anyone being asked this on a viva or being on the exam, but you can just imagine that this would be a really, really easy question to get confused about. Um, and it's a very practical application of diffusion capacity and its measurement. So uh, I thought it, we'd, we'd go through this anyway, because um, it's, it's uh, just really, really important. So diffu uh, diffusion capacity is DL, and that's what you'll often see on your lung function test. So DL is area on thickness times another D, and that D, as um, Maggie, you rightly mentioned, is the solubility uh, over the molecular weight. So specifically, yep, solubility over the square root of the molecular weight of your, uh, of your gas. So that's your DL. That's a very specific term called diffusion capacity. So why use this? Actually, Maggie, do you wanna, can I, can I keep quizzing you on this just, just because? Yeah. <laughs> so why, why use DL instead of you know, in individually looking at all of these components? Um, I think it's because the, the area and the thickness, uh, you can't really measure that in the lung. Um, and the D is specific to the, to the gas that you're measuring, so they just sort of lump them all together. Right, it's, it's too difficult to measure. And like with, like with a lot of things in maths and measurement, you can just lump things together in this kind of variable. Uh, and it still gives a very meaningful value that we can, that we can use for you know, clinical purposes. So if you, re if you rearrange fixed equation, DL is then equal to, you know, so taking that previous equation, if we took, if we took A, and T, A over T times D to the side, then A, on, A over T times uh, solubility over the square root of molecular weight is the transfer of gas over the pressure difference. So that's now the formula, like we can easily get this formula. So what do you reckon, what, which gas, Maggie, is always diffusion limited? That we could use to help us. I, have, I think they use um, carbon monoxide. Fantastic, that's right. So carbon monoxide, uh, what, and why is that? What does the, that? Wow. Uh, why? Well, I think it's just because it's. Oh, I don't know why it's diffusion limited. Actually, is it not very soluble? I suppose. Why would we use carbon monoxide to to help us with this equation? Because it's not perfusion limited. Yep. And what does that? I'm not sure. Well, that's good. Um, it's, uh, so what's the impact of that in this equation? Uh, so I think because we, we know the normal diffusion of it and it's always diffusion limited. So then if, if you, you can compare what you would normally expect to what the patient has and figure out if there's a diffusion limitation. Uh, that... 
You can probably do that with any, right. any class, but I mean, so the reason you're right in saying it's diffusion limited, which means that it's once the once carbon monoxide goes into the bloodstream, it 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 exerts very little partial pressure. Uh, is is that right? Because it's so tightly bound to hemoglobin, which means that you don't need to solve for this extra P. You know the amount of gas you're giving because that's something you know that you're giving. And you know that initial pressure, the driving pressure, you know that P2 will be zero. And that's why carbon monoxide is really easy to use. It's got a very low partial pressure in blood. And so this equation of DL can essentially be a lot of known factors. I know how much carbon monoxide we're giving and um, you know, I know what the pressure is, the driving pressure is. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. so P2 is zero for carbon monoxide. Exactly. So how do you measure this? So if you were to ask how to measure it, it's a single breath method. Um, you just inspire a dilute mixture of carbon monoxide. You don't give too much because then the patient dies and that's all bad. The rate of disappearance from the alveolar gas during a 10 second breath hold is calculated. Um, and you can measure the transpiratory concentrations with an analyzer. Um, the other gas that's inspired in this is helium, and that's just to measure lung volume because you want to standardize it uh, for lung volumes. Uh, so, what's do you have an idea of a normal value, Maggie, um, with units? Yeah, I think it's twenty-five mil per minute per millimeter of mercury. Yeah, perfect. Right. Um, and, so, and then, what happens on exercise? Does this increase, decrease, stay the same? That should increase. Yeah, absolutely. Increases two to three times because of recruitment and distension of capillaries, which we'll come to. Um, yep, so that, look, that was just a bit of an aside, but I thought it was a really good example of something that would be easy to examine on um, and not necessarily has been yet. And examiners are always looking for ways to you know, further examine. And this is very much um, part of the syllabus. So just to move on, I want you guys to now write out yeah, write an SAQ for, let's so take, take four minutes actually, just in the interest of time. I want you to write, you know, with this, with this format, the definitions of perfusion and diffusion limited. Again, make it as succinct with as little explanation as possible. Draw three or four graphs, um, or, you know, on, on the same graph, you might be able to draw a few of the different example gases. Uh, a normal value for DLCO, which we've discussed and how you can measure it, and what are the factors that are affecting diffusion or perfusion limitation. And just know that one of the easiest ways to discuss this may be just to um, you know, talk about the example gases, uh, and, and that helps you go through a lot of the facets of you know, what makes something diffusion or perfusion limited. And you know, there's certain gases that have a combination of factors that result in overall it being either one or the other. So take four minutes now, uh, write, out an, write out an SAQ, and go for it. So, um, perfusion limitation is when the amount of gas transferred between the alveolus and capillary is dependent on the amount of blood passing through the capillary Perfect. that determines yes. the rate of the transfer. Whereas, nice and simple and doesn't, yeah, literally exactly what you want in definition. Good, keep going. Whereas, diffusion limitation is where the um, rate of transfer is independent of the um, partial pressure in the blood. So it's, it's more a, a factor of the gas properties as opposed to blood flow. Uh, yep, that's right. So it's not, uh, perfusion limitation is transfer, gas, transfer of gas based on blood flow. Diffusion, diffusion limitation is independent of blood flow, but it's dependent on the property of the, of the gas and something else. And the uh, the bar the barrier between the, the blood and uh, the capillary and the alveolus and the diffusion barrier. So great. Uh, and if you were just to say it in terms of what it's dependent on, regardless of what it's independent on, again that'd be a really short, sharp way of saying it quickly and just moving on. Yeah. Uh, good. Um, in terms of the let, let's go straight to we've gone through the definitions. We've gone through the normal values already. Twenty five mils per minute per. Um, now, if we were to go for the for getting the four graphs for now, what are the factors that affect whether something is perfusion or diffusion limited? Um, so the solubility of the gas. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, the um, C carbon monoxide has a very high solubility. Yes. So, and that means there's a slow rate of equilibration. And yes. so it becomes diffusion limitate, limitation. 
Perfect. And where does that not, so you, you're right in saying solubility is a factor. So increased solubility helps the gas become diffusion limited, but is there an example where a gas is highly soluble but is perfusion limited? Highly soluble but is perfusion limited. Yeah. Uh, nitrous? Exactly. So now we have a situation where you can say high solubility helps or, you know, makes a gas tend to be more perf uh, diffusion limited, but nitrous isn't this. And why is that so? Um, because the, the nitrous is so soluble that the alveolar and the alveolus and the arterial nit nitrous will equilibrate very quickly within like 0.2 seconds. Good. And is that, you just, you mentioned something that isn't quite right. Is that because it's very soluble in blood or very not, like not very soluble in blood? Very soluble. So nitrous is thought to be very insoluble in blood, whereas carbon monoxide is very soluble, like, you know, very quickly binds to hemoglobin so that it doesn't exert any partial pressure. So I just changed that term to say nitrous isn't very soluble, therefore exerts a partial pressure in the blood very quickly to make it perfusion limited. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So Chris, yeah, yeah. So that is, um, you know, great. You know, you can use solubility as an example that it tends to make something more diffusion limited. But if something is very insoluble in blood, um, then it will have a high rate of, um, it, it, so it, like it has a high, yeah, it has a high solubility across, across the diffusion barrier, but it's relatively insoluble in blood. Anyway, uh, what else, what other factors do you have? So the, the, the barrier itself, Perfect. the diffusion barrier. Yeah. So if it's thick, obviously it slows the diffusion. And so for example, like in, um, in oxygen, it can change the oxygen from being perfusion limited to diffusion limitation. Yep. Sounds good. And you could, you know, cite any kind of disease process that would, um, you know, thicken the barrier. Uh, what other factors? Um, so things like exercise and transit time. Great. Transit time, exercise being an example. How does that work? So normally the transit time through the alveolus is about 0.75 seconds. Mm -hmm. Whereas in exercise, because if you increase cardiac output, you get reduced transit time. And if it's less than sort of 0.25 seconds, you prevent equilibration between the PAO2, P big A and P small a o2 and then oxygen becomes diffusion limitation limited right. instead and just to push you to an answer then if you're if you know anyone here in this session was to do exercise and decrease the transit time of the red blood cell from you know 0.75 to 0.25 seconds would they become diffusion limited or would they stay perfusion limited Diffusion limited? Now that sounded like a question. Are you sure? <laughs> no, now that you're asking me that question, I'm not sure. That's right. Oh, by the way, here's a, here's a, here's a good um, exercise, a oh, good thing to think about. If the examiner asks, are you sure? What does that usually mean? You're wrong. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's, 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 it's very, un, it's very um, unlikely to be testing your conviction about something if you've got something right. So Michelle, if you said uh, this, you know, th that means that this would be perfusion limited. And I said, are you sure? That would be pretty unfair of me as, as an examiner to do that. The examiners traditionally have always erred on the side of, if you were to say something not quite right and say, oh, look, you know, it's, it's diffusion limited because there's a lot of terms flying back and forth. They're very likely to say, look, are you sure about that? Because you know, you've been doing well so far. So does that make sense to everyone? If you get asked, are you sure? It's probably not testing how sure you are about something or how, you know, your, your conviction about a right answer. It's pro they're probably giving you a bit of an out to say that, look, you know, you may have just misspoken and we just want to clarify what you said. I think the only couple of times that that changes uh, is if you are constantly getting wrong answers, which hopefully no one is, or if you have an inflection in your voice to make it sound like you aren't sure of your answer. Because then the examiner is genuinely asking, are you sure to one, you know, to, to, to try and test your conviction. So Michelle, in that example, 
you know, you, you, you know, you, you rightly were trying to think of the answer and you, you said an answer with an inflection, which makes me as an examiner think, Oh, well, you're not sure I better check. And then you'll second guess. So it's almost always worthwhile saying something deliberately without any inflection, just to give an answer in the exam. Obviously this is a different situation, but it's worth doing that. Um, yeah. So it's definitely, you know, I think you can all, all imagine the circumstances where giving confident answers is pretty useful. And if you genuinely aren't sure, you know, to, to say so is fine. This was, yeah, this was obviously not, not, not that case, but that's good. Uh, good. So yeah. Uh, so the, 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 you know, the text would say you'd still be perfusion limited most of the time, even in exercise, unless another factor happened. Um, and what are these other factors then to keep going through? Um, so we said, um, yep, solubility, properties of the blood gas membrane, uh, transit time through the blood. So going back to the COVID equations, a partial pressure gradient driving. Absolutely. So give me an example. So um, say at altitude, if you're exercising at altitude. Okay. So suddenly you've, you, you not only got exercise, but you're, you know, you're climbing Mount Everest and you're at altitude. Now you will you know, very likely become diffusion limited. Uh, is there any other factors uh, that affect uh, whether a gas is diffusion or perfusion limited? Look, the other thing I've got here is just how much gas is bound to other constituents. And we kind of mentioned that as well. Carbon monoxide is bound tightly. Therefore, it doesn't equilibrate quickly at all. And so it's diffusion limited, whereas nitrous oxide is minimally bound. Therefore, there's a very fast rate of rise of the partial pressure. Uh, good. In, 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 so I imagine that everyone... You know, the four gases that you could really kind of get, you know, uh, you know draw graphs about and um, give examples on are these ones here. So I've taken the, the, these three here from West, they're probably all pretty familiar to you. So being able to, you know, draw that with the time in the capillary on the X axis, because that's practically what you, know, what you want to know, and the partial pressure with, without necessarily any units, but um, having alveolar partial pressure up here and zero at the bottom is, you know, is a useful way of doing that as well. Um, and then I just Googled, um, you know, CO2. So imagine the next step of this is to try and, you know, talk about carbon monoxide, sorry, carbon dioxide, and whether that's perfusion or diffusion limited. And it's, you know, slightly different because it's an expired gas rather than inspired gas. Um, and I can imagine that you, you know, in a viva, the next level of question after you've drawn your typical graphs is then to draw something that's, you know, slightly outside of the box. So I thought I'd just chuck that in. You know, so feel free to Google that or take a screenshot to you know, help you explaining that. So does that work? Um, so CO2 transfer the other way out is about the same as oxygen in, or should it be a little bit quicker because it's... It's about, yes, yeah, so it's more, um, just, from, just from looking at the graph, it, it, it does look like it's pretty much similar. So it's normally perfusion limited. It's more soluble than oxygen. But the uh, limiting factor for CO2 is this dissociation of carbon amino compounds and bicarbs. So it's what, what I've got here is in disease, in disease, it may become diffusion limited with a difference between the end capillary blood and alveolar. Um, yeah, I, I hope that explains that difference. But yeah, you, you'd think because it's more soluble, it would be, you know, it would transfer faster. But um, yeah, I mean, th th this, is, this is all I've got for that. Yeah, because I like we, you know with type one respiratory failure, you're, while you'd be hypoxic, you generally your CO two is okay until you develop severe diffusion limitations, and then you get a type two respiratory failure, or or you hyperventilate for that matter. Yeah, uh, and I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how you know how the graph will look. Unfortunately, sorry. Yeah. Okay, no worries. Cool. And define venous admixture, and briefly explain how it influ influences arterial oxygen tension. Um, so venous admixture, I got the definition as the amount of mixed venous blood that would need to be added to pulmonary and capillary blood uh, to produce the observed fall in um, PO2 from the O2, uh, from the, sorry, from the partial pressure of O2 in the end capillary blood to the systemic artery. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, is it a, and the extra thing about it, like, is this a, how, is this real? Is it conceptual? Uh, it's conceptual. Yeah, you wouldn't actually be able to do it. Great. So it's a theoretical amount. Uh, keep going. Um, in terms of causes, so broadly, you've got um, shunt and VQ mismatch. 
Um, so anything which causes this shouldn't be that anatomical or pathological. Um, yep. So anatomical, you've got your uh, thebesian veins, your bronchial veins. Um, pathological, you've got um, sort of vascular causes like intracardiac shunts, uh, yep. communicating vessels such as uh, AV malformation or uh, patent ductus arterius. Um, and then you've, I suppose in that as well, you've got your intrapulmonary shunts as well, which is the most common cause, I think. Um, so, yeah, Shunt is physiological bronchial venous blood or um, Fabesian circulation veins, Path pathological you mentioned. Keep going. Okay. Um, and then you've got functional shunt as well. So um, that uh, goes back to the local VQ mismatches in the different lung units um, where there's uh, more perfusion, particularly towards the bases um, and uh, proportionally less ventilation there compared to uh, so I'm trying to describe the graph, but essentially at the base of the lungs, you have more fusion and less ventilation. At the uh, the top, you have, uh, sorry, the APCs, you have more ventilation, but less perfusion. Beautiful. So essentially throughout your lung, you've got just differing BQ segments, BQ units, and these aren't perfect. And because they're not perfect, you have a proportion of blood that, you know, is, is not as oxygen as it could be. And you mentioned how at the bases, we'll go through this in more detail when we're looking at the um, facets of the, ape, the apex to the base of the lung. And you mentioned like the, the, bot, the base of the lung has more perfusion to ventilation and the top has more, uh, yeah, could you go into that? Yeah, so um, in a normal upright lung, um, due to the effects of gravity mainly, um, you have, I don't know if you've got the graph there, but essentially um, you, can, you can draw a graph which um, the x-axis is the uh, starts at the bases of the lungs and goes across to the uh, APCs. And essentially you have a, um, a fall in both the perfusion and the ventilation as you go. Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, as, essentially both the blood flow and the ventilation proportionally actually fall. Uh, as you go from top to bottom, sorry, from bottom to top. However, the VQ ratio increases. Yep. So the blood flow just seems to fall more than the ventilation does. And you're right. So, so it seems like the these segments here at the top of the lung will have far better oxygenated blood. So why doesn't that kind of balance out? You know, why is it that we've got still this uh, amount of VQ mismatch? which adds, you know, uh, venous admixture to your mix to decrease your PaO2? Um, is it that because you, overall you still have, um, I'm trying to think, well, one can't actually completely make up for the other because um, at the end of the day, if blood's been shunted um, without being oxygenated in one alveolus, it can't be made up for completely by another alveolar unit, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely, that makes sense. Um, so, you know, ad adding deoxygenated blood seems to disproportionately account, you know, account for the fall, um, I'd make up for it with the, um, the, the well oxygenated segments, but also there's just a, a far less volume of blood in the top of the lung, again, due to gravity. So all of these are, you know, the, the, all the blood from the bottom of the lung, the base of the lung, which is poorly oxygenated, it's just more of a volume than at the top. That's, right. well. That's good. So going back to this, uh, good. Um, so essentially, there's just those three things, true shunt, physiological, pathological, VQ inequality. And let's go about calculating this. So what is this, this what is the graph and equation showing? Um, so it comes back to the shunt equation, so which is shown in the top right there. So essentially, it's the poor proportion of uh, shunt blood flow, sorry, shunt blood flow as a proportion of total cardiac output. Um, and then you've got the O2 content, uh, O2 content of end pulmonary capillary blood um, minus the oxygen content of arterial blood. And then that's divided by the O2 content of end pulmonary capillary blood over the mixed venous uh, blood content of oxygen. Beautiful. And again, one of the examiners, uh, uh, was really fond of asking, how do we get these results? Um, so what do you reckon? How do I get these amounts? How do I plug values into and content of n 2 
content arterial O2, content mixed venous O2. Where would I get those values from and how could I do this? Um, so arterial blood, uh, you could just do an arterial, uh, arterial blood guess. Mixed venous blood, um, officially you should do a, uh, you should take it from a um, pulmonary uh, catheter, but often it's just taken from a central line. Um, yep. as a surrogate marker. But you're, um, you're, allowed to, you're allowed to give the ideal. So I'll just say pulmonary artery catheter because that is the way you get mixed venous. So you're correct. Mm -hmm. And how do you get this value here? I actually can't remember, to be honest. That's right. What, what would you need to get that value there? If you were to think of... It, right now, you've got... Actually, it's probably a good time to go into the content equation. Do you remember what that is? Content equation. Uh, so the it's the the content of either arterial or venous oxygen is equal to the um, HB concentration yep. times the H sorry times the Sats. Yep. Times um, and there's variation between textbooks, but either one point three four or one point three nine. Never and then, before, but yeah, uh, one point three four. I'm good with. Added, uh, added to that, it's zero point zero three or zero point zero two, depending on the textbook, um, okay. times the partial pressure of oxygen. Fantastic. Sorry about this, guys. Again, um, but, but you're right about that equation. So, if you can get the PO two, so you know this value, you can get this value through extrapolation once you get the PO2 values. Um, this is a constant here, so you know how to get these. It seems like the, um, this is a constant here, P, uh, 0 0.003. So, so it's 0 0.003, by the way, depending on the units, but generally 0 0.003. Oh, yeah. uh, and then, so how do you get the PO2 of N capillary blood, or blood that's right here? So this is really just the alveolar gas equation. You, whatever value you get of your PaO2 from your alveolar gas equation, that's how you, how you get the value. And then you just plug it into this equation. So again, just, just a useful thing to know where these values come from. Um, because it'll, it'll, I, I suspect that it can have very practical significance if you're in the viva and you get up to that point. You know, it's pretty easy enough to draw this diagram. But get used to drawing this diagram, get used to drawing, you know, each of these points. And then once you, you know, once you've got the shunt equation, the very next question is, well, how, how do you get those values from? Uh, good. Any questions about that before we move on? So just, so when your um, plan here for the SAQ answer says diagrams, just draw three, which diagram are you referring to the, the one yeah, that you showed I'll, us before? I would draw this diagram here and I'd draw uh, actually, uh, you, you'll see the diagrams, and then um, yeah, I'll uh, I'll get back to you on that. But yeah, th this this diagram here, I uh, definitely draw, and also the iso shunt diagram, depending on where the depending on where the CQ goes. Um, uh, Simon, just while you're at it, uh, can you explain to me what this graph is showing? Uh, yeah, let me just remind myself of this one. So, yeah, me too. Okay, so this graph shows the partial pressure of oxygen in millimeters of mercury on the x axis and the oxygen concentrations in milliliters per 100 mils of blood on the y axis. It shows that as the partial pressure of oxygen increases, the oxygen content of blood also increases. Yes. And that the oxygen content of blood rapidly increases up to a partial pressure of approximately uh, 75 uh, millimeters of mercury partial pressure. And then beyond that point, the increase in oxygen concentration uh, begins to plateau. Yes. And now that's really great because you've described a lot of true stuff about this graph. But for some reason, they've chucked in this alveolus with venous admixture and a pulmonary capillary and capillary. So what's that trying to tell me? 
because of the mixing of the blood at the pulmonary and capillary, you get the plateau in oxygen concentration. Is that what I was trying to say? Yeah, I mean, I, I would describe it in terms of chronologic, chronologically. In, in a series of steps, you get alveolar oxygen combining with your, yeah, you know, with your blood at the at the capillary, and so the PO, PaO2 is really incredibly high um, when when you're just looking at it, but it doesn't really add too much content. So even with normal venous admixture being being um, you know, being um, added, as you can mm -hmm. see here, the, even though the PO2 drops staggeringly, like dramatically drops, you still get very little change in content. So the, you know, the, the, you know, we've evolved very, very well to suit this purpose. Like, you know, you think venous admixture is a terrible thing. Like clearly it causes a, a decrement in your PO2, but because of the, because of the shape of the hemoglobin oxygen, oxygen dissociation curve, which we've got here, because of the properties of hemoglobin, it actually doesn't matter for humans physiologically that this occurs. That to me is what this, this graph is trying to illustrate. This could be a problem, however, imagine if this shunt was to increase substantially, you could then imagine that if your PO2 drops significantly because of, because of that, you would get um, you know, a massive fall in your um, you know, a massive fall in your concentration or the content of, of oxygen in your hemoglobin. But in a normal okay. it has very, very little effect on content, therefore won't make a big difference to your oxygen delivery. Um, so the next question, I'll stick with you there, Simon. Um, does shunt affect PCO2? So I'm thinking that shunt shouldn't affect CO2? Yeah, like obviously you've got poor, you know, non-ideal segments of gas exchange occurring, you know, non-ideal gas exchange occurring, but what happens if your CO2 increases? So if, you're, if your CO2 increases, you would, um, you'd have a greater difference in your end capillary compared to your end tide? No. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, confu I'm confusing myself now. Um, That's right. So imagine like, and this is a very specific, um, you know, yeah, it's a very specific part of, you know, respiratory physiology. If your CO2 increases, your brain just senses it. Your, 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 your respiratory centers sense it very rapidly. And all you have to do is increase the amount of ventilation. You just got to increase your respirate, increase your tidal volume, and your CO2 gets very efficiently blown out, very, very efficiently eliminated. So even though shunt might cause a little rise in CO2 because of poorly, you know, poorly ventilating oxygenating segments, it does, just doesn't have an effect. But you just can't do, that, do the same thing with oxygen. You can't really vent, you can't really add oxygen in with any kind of efficacy the way you can eliminate CO2. And if you just, I guess, you know, think, thinking about that, how, how, you know, how would you, by, by, by increasing your rest rate, you can decrease your CO2, which might alter your alveolar gas equation a little bit, but really the way to increase your oxygen is to give more oxygen or to somehow ventilate, you know, oxygenate those poorly, um, you know, you, you, those poorly ventilated segments of the lung that are, you know, heading to a shunt. And that's not something you can ease. The body cannot easily do that with normal physiological mechanisms. You've got to add oxygen or you've got to add, um, you know, oxygen to shunted areas. And that, that just doesn't happen. Has anyone seen this diagram before and would they like to explain it? I've seen it before and I can have a go at explaining it. Yeah, go for it. So this is the ISO shunt diagram. Yes. Um, and it's basically um, describing different levels of shunt and their effect on um, arterial PO2 at a given inspired oxygen concentration. So at zero, so no shunt, with increasing inspired oxygen, you get an increase in your arterial um, partial pressure of oxygen. At 10% shunt, you can still achieve the same partial pressure of oxygen, but you need to be almost at a maximum inspired oxygen concentration, so close to 100% oxygen. And then with increasing amounts of shunt, you can never really achieve um, the same arterial partial pressure of oxygen, even at 100% inspired oxygen. 
um, and that relationship gets less and less with higher degrees of shunt. And at 50% shunting, sort of, you can't really increase your partial pressure of oxygen at all by inspired oxygen content. Yeah, that's great. So, you know, reasonably easy to describe and hopefully be too familiar to you if you, you know, if you get this on exam or you need to draw, you can pretty easily draw something like this to show that example of, um, you know, increasing oxygenation, having limited ability to compensate for larger degrees of shunt. Um, and, you know, practically speaking, I think when I was reading this in none, so, uh, so just for everyone's benefit, this, this particular diagram is page 124. So 124 in non sixth edition. Um, it talks about how in ICU, they would, you know, I don't know if they, I don't think they, they do it now. I've, I've never seen them do this, but you can calculate if, if you, if you have someone with some kind of lung disease, uh, you can cal you can figure out the amount of shunt as well by taking arterial PO2 measurements at different inspired oxygen concentrations and depending, you know, you know, assuming some variables like, you know, HB and the PACO2, et cetera, uh, you can calculate how much shunt they have with these ISO, you know, by comparing it to these ISO shunt lines. Um, so yeah, just just something out of, out of nuns that was a that was a kind of a practical application of this. So we've gone through uh, lung volume capacity. So we've gone through all these objectives. We won't go through them. Next week, I think you've I've already given out the syllabus for next week. Uh, next week is our last week, and we'll outline the you know methods to measure VQ inequalities, discuss carriage of oxygen, the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve and oxygen stores and the clinical significance. Uh, we'll discuss the carriage of oxygen in blood. Uh, sorry, I've doubled that up, sorry. Uh, discuss the difference between pulmonary and systemic circulations, discuss, discuss pulmonary vascular resistance uh, and outline non-ventral functions of the lungs. <laughs>